Hey, we're on to chapter five. So this is actually, I would say, really the last kind of theory chapter in terms of things that if you took like a full micro course, you, you would cover this and a few other things like poverty and environmental stuff maybe. So um, hang in there. Uh, we'll actually see some applications this chapter. One nice thing about this chapter is that it's actually very analogous to the uh, consumer chapter that we just looked at. So, okay. Ooh, a lot of learning objectives, okay. I'll let you read through those. Again, I highly encourage you to print out, you know, six slides per page or whatever um, trade-off you want between your print budget and your um, your eyesight, I guess. So, um, but print that out. That way uh, you can refer to it during this uh, lecture as well as when you're working through the uh, homework problems and other uh, questions. So, okay. So the production function, this is uh, it's kind of like utility analogy, but um, th this is real, <laughs> that you have certain inputs. So um, Q is the level of output. Uh, I don't know why they didn't use O, but maybe it looks like zero. Uh, F is just saying it's, it's going to be a mathematical function, no surprise in this class. K is for capital. Okay. Uh, C was already used by consumption in economics, so it's like the German Das Kapital. Okay, and then L's for labor, one that we can remember a little easier. So, okay. and this chapter, it's going to look at costs from a, uh, a number of ways, breaking them down into components as well as um, time. Okay, so are we interested in the short run uh, when uh, there's maybe contractually or otherwise there's not enough time to adjust or in a longer period usually think of a year or two or longer where it's like well if we were gonna kind of like start from scratch basically not really start from scratch but have enough time to really make some major changes that is going to be the determinant there so alright so measures of productivity so total product is essentially the production function um, and then we can look at the average product, which is the total Q divided by uh, some level of input, labor, or capital. Marginal products, remember marginal always means extra. And that is uh, the change in output uh, for at some level of change in uh, one of the inputs. So here's an example here. Again, I'm going to leave that to you to look through. There's others in the book, of course. So here's a graph. Um, let's just kind of run through this here. So the total product, you would think, all right, yes, as we're increasing labor on the horizontal axis, uh, that would always go up. But there's actually, uh, and it, it does generally. At some point, though, um, it, it may actually go down. We have too many workers. Um, maybe the quality of workers, though that's usually uh, in, in the textbook the assumption is you're adding a worker as a worker, not you don't take the top-notch worker and then the, the second tier and then some third tier where they're not very good. Um, but um, anyway, so total product generally is going to rise. Uh, with that, the, uh, the average is going to rise for a while, but then it will also fall. So uh, same thing with the marginal product, and that is essentially driven by these diminishing uh, returns. Kind of coming back to the idea, yes, that as you add more uh, people, even of the same quantity, of the same quality, I should say, but you don't change other inputs like the machines they have to work with, they're going to be at some point actually uh, a little less productive than they were when you know, everyone had their own um, tractor to ride on or their own place in the factory. Okay. All right, no, some extra pieces there on the graph there. Um, so uh, the manager, what, what do they care about? Well, of course, some, some of you, many of you probably are going to be working in service industries. So, um, so it's not quite the same thing as having a widget at the end of the assembly line, but it could still be the same thing. So we start 
with a new MBA student and 15 months later, maybe, if we push it, 12 months, I guess, if you really get after it. Yes, it's supposed to be 12 months. Um, then then you're, you're, we've got a newly minted MBA. Okay. And uh, the second uh, bold point here is really probably, the, I would say, the, one of the key ideas. I don't want to say too much, but um, certainly one, if not the biggest idea is well, how, how would you pick? Uh, you know, there's um, different types of labor. You can substitute technology or capital for, for workers. So what, what is the best mix? Okay. All right, so a lot of terminology here. Uh, probably this is one of those chapters you have to read twice to, to take it all in. Uh, so you can read the definitions here. I already mentioned the second one, the law of diminishing returns. And then um, I think we'll see this more in the next couple of slides. Uh, we want to find, it kind of comes back to this idea of cost benefit analysis. We want to find the point where, as long as the uh, additional value added or value marginal product is, is increasing, or excuse me, is, is at least the value of the worker is adding is at least as much as their wage, uh, then that's a good thing. Okay, So one thing here, it's a, a little bit tricky as again kind of economics is like well how can you measure, well some of this is kind of fuzzy, well you can't necessarily just hour by hour reserve someone's production and then say stop at three o'clock or keep working for into the evening because you're such a good worker and uh, then that would also maybe change the wage. So. Uh, we'll see some examples here. So, all right. Uh, so one thing is, uh, we'll, we can see all three of these in terms of production function mathematical forms. So the first one is, is just saying, um, uh, well, there's a linear relationship between the two. Okay. So mathematically, it looks maybe the simplest. The Leontiev is, I think, some Polish economist from 100 years ago or 50 years ago that came up with this mathematical way saying that, well, you need the right combination. So back to what I said a minute ago, you need one, you have one tractor, you need one driver for that tractor. You can't have, um, it doesn't always have to be one-to-one, -one, but it doesn't help to have two drivers, really. Uh, there's just one riding shotgun and not probably adding real, any real value. Okay. Com Douglas is popular and um, kind of show, shows the again the, the relationship between the two that when you increase one of the inputs uh, it's going to have an impact on the other input as well. We don't have that in the linear one. Okay. So here's an example just plugging in K and L, that's simple for you guys. Okay. Um, back to those three forms, so in our earlier definition, so we can find, uh, we're given these formulas. So for the linear, we can find the marginal product of capital and the marginal product of labor. And likewise, we can find the average product of capital, and average product of labor. Those are given just based on the formula parameters. And likewise, with the Cobb-Douglas, it has some nice forms there. Uh, here's an example. Again, I'll just let you look through that. Okay. All right, so isoquants. Okay. Sounds to me like a Korean um, uh, car manufacturer or something. So what am I thinking of that for? Um, anyway. I'll have to come up with a better. Quants, maybe that's, I don't know, I should say a Wall Street um, analogy there or something. So anyway, essentially it's saying, yes, as you can see here, it's the combinations of inputs that yield the same output. Okay. And that brings us back to that question, well, which, if, if they yield the same output, which one's better? Which one's cheaper as, as it is? Okay. So, so the marginal rate of technical substitutions, uh, this is 
This lecture is starting to sound like an engineering talk here, uh, not just because it's technical, but there's a lot of, a lot of formulas being throw, thrown at us. And, um, well, the formula is given there. It is essentially that trade-off between the um, uh, two inputs that would uh, keep us at the same level of, of, of production. Okay. So. And I mentioned this in the intro of, to this lecture, that if you just looked at this and didn't look at the labels, you'd think, oh, that, that's those, 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 those utility curves from the previous chapter. And it's kind of the same idea here, but now instead of representing some hypothetical utility, these are a little bit more concrete in terms of how we might you know, be able to calculate them directly from data or observation. So yeah, these represent different levels of output and then our two axes are well how much you know, so we could have a lot of labor and a little bit of capital just think of farming okay or we could have a really big tractor and awesome whatever um, some kind of farm equipment and we only need a few workers then we don't need as much manual labor so I think that's the simplest analogy okay. and yeah as you move to the northeast in the diagram that represents more labor and more capital, and thus more uh, output. Okay. Let me go ahead and get this all on here. Oops, too far. Okay. Um, so this is um, again this graph kind of filled up with a lot of um, uh, dotted lines and what have you. The gist of it is is that um, at different points on the curve, there's going to be a different levels of trade-off, and that's um, kind of in the middle. There's kind of you could think of it's um, you know you could kind of go either direction, but as you as you start to move to one extreme, where you have a lot of one input and not as much as the other, then the trade-off becomes more um, steep, as it was. Okay, uh, this is just another, uh, we're going to add this here, I think in a minute, to the graph. So we also want to find what combination of inputs yield not the same output, but the same cost. Okay. So this looks like a budget constraint, and it's really, this is like the business um, idea of, of how are you going to maximize uh, production given your cost structure. So again, just like you, very similar to the utility example. Okay. Oops. Right. Uh, so yeah, there looks like they're changing different costs here. Yes. Okay. So same, same idea if, um, if you change, in this case, Looks like they're doing it proportionally. So if everything costs ten percent more, it's going to shift it uh, out to the uh, right. Okay. You can also just have one of the input costs change. So that is again, if you understood the last chapter, it'd be like if just one of the prices changed. All right. Cost minimization and the cost minimizing input rule. Okay. I mentioned this five or so minutes ago, but here's in, in more detail. So we want to produce, you know, you think of, you can think of this two ways. You could think of it as there's a certain goal, a certain production goal that I have, and I want to find how can I do that in the least uh, costly way, okay, the most efficient way, we might say. Uh, you could take that the other direction and say, well, I have so much resources or I have so much budget what's the highest level of output I could achieve given that I have so many workers and um, capital at my disposal or in the business. So the idea here is that you want, as long as you want to pick the, the highest contributor per cost, okay? So as long as um, uh, the, if the worker, if adding an extra worker, just suppose that a worker unit and a capital unit had the same price for now. Um, 
if, if the worker could contribute more to your farm, let's just say, to use a, a old agriculture example, although we'll always need food, um, then you'd hire the worker, okay? Or it was more better to hire or um, you know, get a computer to make you more productive on the farm, which could happen, then, um, then you would go that way. So. Oops, okay. This example, actually, I think they go through this in the book. It's kind of hard. They don't give, um, just, yeah, sorry. Let's just skip that example, okay? So, again, back to this optimal input, I would say, ratio or substitution. Okay, I think I've done all that. Oh, one more. Oops. Okay. All right, so, so this graph, I mean, these are um, ones that would be helpful too if we had some actual numbers rather than L1, L2, and K1, K2, etc. But um, essentially, it looks like we're starting here at. Um, Point, no. Okay. We think we would start at point A. Oh yes. Okay. That's the initial point of cost minimization. So the the outer curve um, is just tangent to the ISO cost line at that point. And then uh, and then we have a a higher wage. Okay. So one thing to at least kind of get things going in the right direction say well if we have, maybe there's a new minimum wage or for some reason you know, workers are demanding and if you don't pay them a higher salary they're going to leave so it's like teachers union or something so um, well you would say well if there's a, a higher wage that's going to uh, make labor more expensive just by definition so we we would we would tend to move away from that. We would tend to try to find ways to do the same things that we'd been doing before, but substitute the now relatively lower cost uh, other inputs. Be it so, just go back to teach, you know try to hire more um, um, para teachers or use uh, online classes to substitute for. An in-person teacher saves colleges money, I think. Okay, so all right. Um, so we, we've done. We've had like four or five really big concepts, uh, and a lot of times this is this comes back to maybe uh, kind of the core. Of what, what what are these costs about? So uh, so we have a few more definitions, of course. Uh, fortunately, these are pretty much self-defining. So fixed costs are uh, very closely associated with, with sunk cost. Um, and kind of coming back to that short run versus long run, there is still a distinct, you know, it's not like one year. I mean, it's maybe so. Maybe if you have a one-year contract and then you can let people go or you can return the leased equipment or something. Uh, sunk costs are, are more even permanent that you paid for it and now it's yours. There's no um, getting a refund or what have you. Okay. So variable costs are driven by, well, as you produce more output, you're going to have to have more raw materials, maybe hire more people. So that's where those come from. Oops. Uh, so total cost. Uh, there's a couple kind of inflection points here. So, uh, so initially, uh, you have again. Well, let me just start with a simpler one here. Uh, fixed cost. If it's truly fixed, just it's, it's just going to be a horizontal line. Okay. Uh, variable cost then uh, rise kind of rapidly early on, and that's not always true. It could roughly just be a straight line here, but 
uh, in this graph they're rising kind of rapidly then uh, and that could be like startup cost or tr initial training or uh, and then there's kind of a sweet spot where it kind of doesn't go down but it kind of flattens out more or less doesn't rise as steeply but eventually costs start to rise and that could be due to uh, input uh, restraints on how much you can actually secure or lower um, ability of workers or things like that. Okay. If we add these, this horizontal line or this amount to the variable cost line, that's it's just shifting up this uh, variable cost curve. So average average costs are always just whatever cost we're talking about divided by Q. So we see that three times. Marginal cost is just that, the extra cost to produce one more unit of output. Okay. So. Um. Oops. Okay. Uh, th this is um, again kind of a classic micrograph where you have marginal cost and I'll just go ahead and say it. I mean, it's going to it's going to have this U shape where it goes down. Actually, all three of these have a U shape, and the marginal cost goes to the bottom of average variable cost and average total cost. Okay. And you say, is that all? Yeah, that's always true. At least if you have like nice shaped, smooth curves like we do here. This is probably best seen, and I don't think they do it in the notes here, by actually having some tables or functions and and graphing it out or seeing it in a table but uh, if, if you can trust me it is going to look something like this so we already talked about fixed and suck sunk cost it is a, a probably kind of a in some ways it's simple but it's one of those often mistaken that we tend to uh, especially if it's a mistake <laughs> Uh, kind of live in the past and say, well, we, we have to, since we did this, we have to um, continue to try to fix something. So even if we start a business and it's done, we've invested a bunch of time and money, you should say if it's really, you know, the prospects are really poor going forward, you should say it doesn't matter that we spent a year of our life and $100,000 of other people's money to start a business. It does kind of matter because they'll be angry at you and um, you like to maybe redeem yourself, but if there's only a very small probability of that and it's going to continue to drain you and your resources then that's just a, that's a sunk cost it doesn't it doesn't matter that you that it's really the future going forward do I expect the benefits to outweigh the future cost so um, cost functions so Again, they, they just do a generic example here, but this cubic form tends to allow for you know, a couple kind of curves in the uh, cost function as, as they reach different levels of, uh, of inputs and how that potentially could shift over time. So. Uh, and the last couple of slides here are about uh, long run cost, I believe. And I'll let you read that. I think there's yeah. this gets into, and I think there's one question in the homework assigned. Um, again, it's uh, it jumps in a little bit too quickly here on well, where um, where are these curves coming from, and uh, the idea is well, if you looked at over time, you'd have average total costs for one scenario, and then a second scenario is output increased and then a third scenario and what that traces out is this long run average cost curve and this will be important for well in, in the long run if we're really looking for the optimum mix so we're not just looking at uh, so an example would be plant size should we have or just go back to school size you know is the best Say elementary school, 100 students per class, 500 
1500 like uh, Scott County has here in uh, Kentucky and um, so that that's this idea that we're trying to find if we had complete freedom in adjusting our um, uh, inputs where would we get this absolute minimum this Q star on this diagram some of this repeats again so um, but this is yeah kind of the same idea of kind of some diminishing returns so economies of scale are a big idea that going back to my school example is UK because it's scaled up of all if you took all the private colleges in the area and put them together it probably still wouldn't be as big enrollment wise as, as UK uh, so there could be economies of scale or just having a bigger classroom more students in a class with still one professor and that seems to be economies of scale at some point though uh, you get kind of too big so that's the diseconomies and at some point, it's it's relatively, uh, you could say, indifferent. That is, you scale up, you, you keep the same efficiency or cost structure. Okay. So back to, oops. Okay. So here would be, yes, as you're, as you're raising output, the long-run average cost, so the trying to minimize that, the average cost per unit is here and then as you move uh, to the right then you kind of gotten too big that you know, the school is too big too informal or the plant is too big to uh, work within the various similar lines or what have you okay. the cost of the return to scale is just flat okay that one's a little simpler in a way it doesn't matter So, so this one, uh, it almost looks like I'm going to say economies of scale again, but economies of scope, which is closely related. Uh, here, instead of producing the same uh, output, just Q, or call it Q1, now we're producing um, two different types of output. Okay, so two different uh, car brands are making... Uh, uh, brakes and struts in the same factory. Okay, so some similar ideas there, how they work together, uh, or maybe against each other. Uh, hopefully, there's a complementary relationship where you have the factory, you have mechanics and engineers, and people trained on both, so absentee problems aren't as bad when you have people to cover. All right. Wow, this has been a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, so, once again, kind of a generic model of now having a multi-product Q1 and Q2 cost function, where there's some uh, relationship or dependency between the two. They're just not two items in the same factory that have no common inputs. Okay. End of show. So uh, yeah, this is this is a lot to take in, and um, as I was going through it, there I was like, yeah, this is this is in some ways a pretty one of the tougher chapters, and and that's saying something. So um, I will promise this though: the next chapter, it's kind of like we're done with. I don't say we're done with algebra, or we're done with math, because we're not. But it's more uh, the answers a lot of times don't require any uh, calculations, but in this chapter they do. So. As you work through the chapter or the homeworks, I think you'll see um, how we can kind of tie these together. And I, I mentioned in the uh, on discovery there, my email, that I'll I'll put together a study guide, uh, and that way you can kind of go through checklist and try to tie it to various homeworks as well, so you can say, oh yeah, this is how we might use this multi-product cost function. So, all right. Um, I'll be in touch this week. We will have a an online session. I'll record it for those that can't come, but that way we can um, discuss any of these chapters, and we'll be getting ready for our uh, exam. So we will get to that shortly. All right. Thanks. Take care.